Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our session addressing corruption in health systems, innovative examples from research and practice. So this morning, we're going to be discussing, having a presentation and hopefully an interactive discussion about corruption, one of the most serious issues to be challenging health systems, especially, I believe, during this crisis. Two years ago, with colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Dina Balabanova and Martin McGee, we wrote an editorial in the Journal of Health Policy and Management, arguing that it was time health policy and systems researchers started talking about corruption and started pushing forward a new agenda to tackle this incredibly important problem. While we could see innovation in anti-corruption research in other sectors, we didn't really see the same thing happening or the same sorts of discussions happening, especially in health systems. And we wrote this article in a way as a call to arms for people to start tackling the problem. Two years later, and after a slew of responses to our editorial, each of which agreed that corruption was a major problem for health systems, and each of which presented a, uh, an important way in which we could start tackling um, corruption, it was clear that there was a growing movement of researchers and bureaucrats and policymakers who were seeking new and innovative ways to tackle corruption in countries across the world. Critical, I think, among these in the last couple of years was that we noted in 2009, the UN General Assembly Decla Declaration on Universal Health Coverage recognised corruption as a serious barrier to effective resource mobilisation and allocation. And they also recognised that fighting corruption at all levels had to be a priority. Since then, the World Health Organization, Global Fund and UNDP have also started work to establish a coalition of actors. So work is especially afoot. But as we wrote that editorial and read its subsequent responses to the, to the commentaries, none of us had envisaged the pandemic that we're all living in, nor the forms of corruption that are emerging as we seek to distribute medicines and vaccines and provide support across the world for the poor's most vulnerable people. I think it needs to be underscored, especially in light of the fact that we don't have examples of um, corruption in Europe or in North America in our set of presentations, that we also see corruption across these countries. In my own country, the United Kingdom, we're concerned about companies with no or little capacity to deliver consumables that were needed in the National Health Service were given um, to friends and funders of political parties. We also are worried about the supply of substandard laptop, substandard food parcels by companies that we suspect were given contracts, not on the basis of their merit. And while court cases will let us know whether this has been illegal or not, it conforms to the definition of corruption that we think should be widely used in health systems. So when we think about corruption today, what we're thinking about is the abuse or complicity in abuse of public or private provision, power or authority to benefit oneself, to benefit a group or an organization. So this is close to definitions of corruption we've had, but here in a health systems definition, we need to make sure that what we're looking for are acts that divert institutions from their core aims. We're looking for forms of corruption that undermine health systems. In our session then, we're going to hear examples from Nigeria, from Tanzania, from Bangladesh, and from Colombia. The first three presentations of which I will also give one, I'm chairing and also giving a presentation, come from some work that has been done under the SOAS ACE Consortium where we're trying to use innovative approaches that take the political economy into account, not only when we're researching corruption that exists, but when we're thinking critically about ways in which corruption can be tackled. The final presentation is from Colombia and presents an account of risk indicators for corruption in public hospitals, which is going to be a key method through which we're going to be able in the future to identify where these hotspots of corruption occur and upon that basis consider innovative ways in which they can be tackled. We're going to have around 50 minutes to an hour for presentations. Unfortunately, one of our presenters can't be with us today. Mr. Alok Kumar um, is not going to be here. So we'll have four presentations of around 12 to 15 minutes. 
I will open the floor after each for any points of clarification, um, but we want to leave the main discussion to the end when we'll have somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes to discuss what it is that you've heard in this morning's event. So our first presenter this morning um, is Charles Orgiaco, who has worked with the Health Policy and Research Group at the University of Nigeria in Anugu for a number of years. And he's going to speak on identifying key players and strategy in tackling corruption, application of outcome mapping to absenteeism in primary health centres in Nigeria. Charles, over to you. Over to you. Yeah. Um... Thank you very much, Elano. Um, so the, uh, my presentation is on um, the identifying key players and um, key strategies to tackle corruption. And um, we are using the outcome mapping approach to do this. Yeah, so we've been working um, on this project I, my team, Professor Bina, Elena, Dina, and we've been trying to tackle um, the corruption problem um, in Nigeria's healthcare system. And um, so if I just give a rundown of um, the ACE approach and um, what it stands for. So we, we are approaching corruption from a unique perspective and what we call the anti-corruption evidence approach. So S is um, a development project that is um, looking at understanding the political economy of developing countries, essentially developing countries, and then trying to build evidence of why corruption is happening. And at the same time, build evidence again of a potentially effective anti-corruption strategy. The goal of this is to identify specific types of corruption and then to see if these specific types of corruption can be feasibly solved. And when we solve them, um, we should be sure that it's having an impact on development community development, national development. But you know, the two keywords are feasibility. Uh, are we able to solve this type of corruption? We accept that not all types of corruption are feasibly solvable. But we are looking for those ones, as little as they are, that we can do something about. And when we change this um, problem, or pro I mean, provide an approach, a solution to that problem, there will be an impact on development. And so ACE have, you know, different strategies that its um, interventions or solutions align with. So we have aligning incentives, you know, trying to find out parties that partake in a corruption problem and then kind of build an incentive structure such that different players um, would benefit and also they will try to drop the rule breaking behaviors they may be doing which we interpret as corruption we can design for differences um, for instance um, in nigeria the private health sector and the public health sector are not um they, they do not operate in the same way and so we do not expect government policy, health policies to um, simultaneously handle these two parties. And so we see a lot of corruption happening just because policies are designed in a straight jacket way. And then we expect private guys to play in the same platform with public institutions. We can resolve rights where um, people who are suffering because of corruption do not know that they have a right and when we educate them about these rights, you know, they can stand up for themselves and um, you know, stop the corruption happening. We can also build coalitions. By building coalitions, we mean, um, so getting agencies, individuals, um, community groups who have an interest 
in a corruption problem and wants to solve it. But when we can align their interests together, when we can explain to them that if they come together and push for this particular problem, that they're likely going to get a positive outcome. And that's building. So th these are the four main um, strategies, generally. There are more, but these are the four main ones that um, come up in the A strategy. We can also read Khan et al. To, to, to see um, a full description of what is and the approach is about. So on the S Health project in Nigeria, what we have done is to systematically identify the most worrying corruption problems. So we did a systematic review and we also did a stakeholders workshop and they are all published you know, in journals that you can assess. Um, so the systematic review and the workshops helped us to um, identify the top priority problems and absenteeism of health workers came top. Health workers are absent from the health centers and then people who come to get services, particularly poor people, um, they come to health centers to get treatment, to get services and nobody is there. And then we keep ha having cases of death, um, mortality deaths, um, people not being able to get vaccines, people not being able to get the required services that is always available at the grassroots. And so absenteeism for us, we found after we interacted with stakeholders, that if we can do something about it, it's going to have a high impact. We're going to see more people accessing healthcare. We're going to see the health performance and health indices of the country improve. And so we started with a state, just one state, a local state, to look at the problems around and then try to understand why health workers don't come to work. Like I said earlier, the ACE approach is evidence-based. You have to provide evidence of why a problem is happening. What is the nature of this problem? Who are those involved? And then how can we solve them? So we started exploring for underlying political, socioeconomic, structural, and institutional drivers of absenteeism. And we are also looking at the same time for potential solutions. Outcome mapping. So, so outcome mapping is um, a package within the ACE program. So the ACE program adopted the outcome mapping as a framework to monitor progress. So traditionally what happens is um, people, groups, NGOs deliver interventions. They see a problem, they move straight, they develop an intervention, they um, kind of um, roll out the intervention in the community. After that, they go back and then come back to monitor, you know, and evaluate how much has been achieved. The, the outcome mapping is different. It's different in, in the sense of um, that it's progressive. So as the program is going on, as the intervention is going on, we are taking track of what has changed. What, I mean, who do we aim to influence? In what way are we trying to influence this person? What does this person stand to benefit if he stops a particular type of problem? Um, and so in, in a way is um, a kind of a living monitoring and evaluation package that goes along with um, the intervention or as long as the program lasts to be able to detect changes happening along the line. You know, it's, it's not kind of designed to say, here is, the, here is the intervention, we give the intervention, and then we, 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 we come back to evaluate the intervention. No, it's an ongoing process. We are doing the intervention at the same time, monitoring the progress of the intervention. And so particularly we are looking for, um, in the outcome mapping, we are looking out for behavioral changes among our boundary partners. So our boundary partners are people, are groups, are individuals, are community members, are agencies whom we hope our project, our intervention is going to impact. 
So we, we want absenteeism to stop in health centers, but we may not have the power as researchers to go there and ask them, oh, stop being absent in work. We need you to stop being absent in work. We don't expect that just by listening to us, they will stop you know, their absenteeism. We hope to walk through mechanisms. We hope to walk through agencies. We hope to walk through um, people in the community. These are boundary partners, people we hope to influence, to bring into the project so that they will understand that um, if they move, if they make a move, um, things can change in the health center. So what, what have we done so far? From 2018 till last year, we've had several waves of interviews and focus group discussions in the communities. And through this process, we've identified who our boundary partners are, the key stakeholders and players, the people who we wish to influence so that they will bring the change we desire. Between July and September, we have also explored different um, health worker choices. So the interviews and the FGDs helped us to understand what the health workers want, um, what they think we should do, and then absenteeism will stop. So they, they, they informed us to develop policies, potential policy solutions that can help them adjust um, their lives so that they will be always be present in the health centers. So we did that using a discrete choice experiment. We've also continued having research meetings to review these boundary partners. And we are looking out for who is powerful among um, our boundary partners, who has interest in changing things, who can actually make a move. So we've had several research meetings to review our boundary partners, dropping some, prioritizing others, you know, trying to know who exactly has the power and the interest to achieve um, the goal of our project. Also, we have you know, supportive meetings. So additional, um, twice a year, we have a review meeting with an outcome mapping expert who helps us to um, look at what we've done over the year and then help us identify what the successes have been. How has our project progressed? In what ways have we gained? You know, in what ways have we also somehow lost? In what ways are we not doing well? Who should we target, essentially? So I'm going to share um, another chat that shows, you know, how these um, boundary partners, how we pick them and choose them and fix them. So this is a power and al an alignment and power matrix that shows who the partners are, the ones we identified. So at the top right side of um, the, the plane, so you can see the people who we think are powerful enough and have sufficient interest to follow down um, the policies we are hoping to bring to them. So the person who is the executive director of the primary healthcare development agency um, is one person we identified. The managers of public health facilities, particularly the primary health centers. We are another group who we think are powerful enough and also have the interest to follow down on the problem of absenteeism. We also identified community members. So there is health facility committee, what people also call what development committees. The people who head these committees also have interests. They want their people to be getting the services um, whenever they come to the health centers. So they have interests. On the left hand side, we can see health workers. So health workers um, may have an interest 
particularly health workers who um, want to follow the rule, who want to come to work. Yeah, so they will have an interest if all of their fellow workers come to work as well, because if they don't come, it means that the workload on them will also be high. Anti-corruption agencies, medical professionals as well, um, professional associations will also want um, health, um, the health sector to be improved. They will also want to reduce corruption. But at the same time, these guys may not have the power to influence or implement policy. And that's why they are there on the left-hand side of the plane. At the bottom right, we are looking at guys who are powerful, but um, may not have interest. Two minutes, powerful. Charles. Sorry to come over you. Two minutes. All right, sorry. So, so, so this is how, you know, the frame looks. And um, so, so what have we achieved so far? We have identified these guys, people who we can work with. We've um, tried to understand um, the political and the structural and the institutional influences that drive absenteeism. Um, some of our works have been published. Um, we've seen, we've tried to understand more deeply what are the underground connections, who is doing what, and um, how do structural and institutional problems contribute to absenteeism. And so we, so, so the outcome now is that the executive director of the primary health care agency have picked interest in our work and has offered to approve the project whenever we are ready and to support us through it. And he also awaits our findings to inform um, absenteeism policy in the state. At the community level, we have seen awareness grow so much that even local radio stations are beginning to talk about health worker absenteeism, beaming more light on the health workers you know, and kind of compelling them to come to work. We never expected that um, this would be a thorn in our, in our project, but this is how outcome mapping has helped us to identify successes happening, even when we are not paying attention to them. Then also health workers who continue to see us at the health centers are becoming more self-conscious. They think we have come to monitor them and then they are beginning to adjust and be more present in work. And so we also have gotten people from the international community asking us to share our experiences. So these are successes we've had in our project. Our intervention is not yet in the field, but we have seen people adjusting to the program already. So outcome mapping offers us, you know, a realistic and progressive evaluation of change and the slow and unexpected turns that come up. So we are able to see how our project is changing the community, even when you know, we are not sensitive to those ones. Um, so we are, pro we are also able to progressively identify partners and see how their interests are changing. For instance, politically protected health workers, you know, they have seen that we have come for them and some of them are now changing, you know, aligning back to, um, you know, to the goal of our project, which is to stop absenteeism in health centers. Thank you very Charles, much. Great. Thank you very much, Charles. Superb. I'll just start my video again. Thank you. I think Charles's presentation really nicely shows this the importance of trying to put together strategies that think about um, corruption at the same time that they're thinking about anti-corruption. And it's one of the themes I think that we might want to raise in the discussion, which is this matching as a researcher you constantly need to think about the forms of anti-corruption that may come about as a result of your research and then who it is that you need to talk to and the different partners that you may need to have in the field. So Charles, thank you very much for that. Um, Charles, would you be able to mute your microphone because we're going to move on now. Um, so move from Nigeria to Tanzania to a presentation by Dr. Peter Binyaruka, who's a health economist and health systems researcher within the health systems 
impact evaluation and policy department at Ifakara Health Initiative in Tanzania. Um, and uh, Peter is going to talk to us about understanding public health providers' preferences for interventions against informal payment in Tanzania. Um, and we'll discuss a discrete choice experiment where um, health workers were given different choices in terms of, in relation to new interventions um, that were anti-corruption interventions. So Peter, let me just hand over to you. And again, you have 12 to 15 minutes. I'll give you a two minute warning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, as you said, uh, I'll be presenting this study and uh, which focuses on understanding public health uh, providers' preferences for interventions against informal payments in Tanzania uh, with the use of district choice uh, experiment. Uh, first of all, as Charles previously explained about the ACE uh, strategy, anti-corruption evidence strategy or consortium, which we are working together across three countries, Tanzania, Nigeria, and Bangladesh, uh, we intended to identify some key measures uh, to try and reduce different forms of corruption, which includes informal payment. And for us in Tanzania, we uh, conducted a couple of uh, uh, approaches in terms of doing this study. First of all, we started with the literature review and then some sort of rounds of qualitative interviews with different key stakeholders, uh, health workers, as well as uh, policymakers, and also a couple of workshops and also we conducted a survey of public health workers. And the, the main aim here is to try and understand the pattern or structures of these uh, different forms of informal payments as, as a focus for, for, for this study in Tanzania. And also to identify the, the drivers or the determinants of informal payment. And the last also to propose some potential measures against informal payments. And here comes in the district choice experiment as an approach. And there is the main talk of this uh, presentation uh, from this side. So to start with the introduction, informal payment for healthcare includes the out-of-pocket payments to individuals as well as institutional providers in kind or in cash, uh, which are made unofficial in most cases to obtain benefits when using public resources. And this kind of informal payments are actually regressive, meaning that the poorest are, are paying substantially higher as compared to the wealthier. Uh, a community and often they limit access to, 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 to health care, especially for this vulnerable population. And uh, to some extent, they may cause catastrophic expenses, uh, especially for those with, with low resources in terms of household resources. Uh, currently, there are various policy options or interventions which are being implemented across uh, countries uh, at facility level as well as at the system level. Uh, but uh, we know little in terms of the acceptability, how uh, health workers or health providers at, at the lower level they, uh, they prefer or they accept these kind of measures in terms of uh, improving accountability or reducing formal payment. So it's more for a top-down kind of strategies which are being uh, proposed in most cases. And we need to have a bottom-up formulation of this kind of strategy or policies to try and understand what they prefer at the lower level uh, in order to improve the acceptability. To, to, to this kind of measures. And then for that case, we would expect some positive uh, outcome. So for this study, we try to, to fill this knowledge gap by using data from Tanzania to try and understand how these uh, public health workers they prefer in terms of measures, different measures to reduce or to work against informal payment, uh, the healthcare setting. So we conducted a survey, a cross-sectional survey of around 432 public health health workers or providers from 42 hospitals and health centers in Tanzania. And uh, we carried out a disk choice experiment, as I mentioned earlier, as uh, an approach to try and uh, cite preferences of these providers. And uh, our study site were two regions, so Dar es Salaam and Pwani, uh, which covers 11 districts. And uh, in terms of designing the disk choice experiment uh, too, we had a couple of stages, five stages uh, to be specific in generating these attributes and levels. Uh, because the disk choice experiment, you, you need to have an attribute, uh, different attribute, attributes as well as the levels. And then, it, uh, so in this process of generating these attributes and levels, we, uh, we had some steps, so the mixed method approach. So we, uh, we had a literature review, we conducted some workshops, some qualitative interviews, 
and then we gathered some expert opinion and then we piloted what we had as a draft of attribute and levels before going for the actual uh, actual actual experiment uh, so finally we generated uh, a dce2 with 12 unlabeled choice sets with two hypothetical jobs so uh, job a and job b as hypothetical with different attributes and levels so this is the the final dce2 so we managed to to generate six attributes job attributes with varying uh, number of levels on each attribute. So the first attribute is the mode of payment. And this attribute actually are those strategies which we feel uh, could work against the informal payment in, in a such a way that can reduce or, uh, or, or avoid or remove uh, chances of engaging in informal payment. For example, the issue of mode of payment, the levels are variable are cash, uh, cash transaction or no cash uh, transaction as cashless transaction. So knowing that uh, in cash transaction, we, 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 we provide an avenue for people to engage in informal payment as compared to cashless transaction. Uh, the other attribute was in terms of supervision at facility level, whether to have a supervision on, on weekdays uh, or to have a supervision throughout 24 hours per day. And also the opportunity to engage in private practice was another attribute with the level of whether to have a dedicated time off to engage in private practice or not to have that opportunity because we know that by having this those kind of private uh, engagement they could uh, add uh, on their salary and uh, in, a, in a such a way that can reduce the chances of engaging in informal payment but all there are other options in terms of awareness and monitoring for example the issue of receipts to all transaction uh, to have a notes facility notes board to display all the services and the fees could increase the awareness to, to, to clients but also to have a hotline number uh, for reporting informal payment uh, whenever they see someone is engaging in informal payment. Uh, the other attribute, the fifth attribute, was on measures against informal payment, uh, disciplinary measures in, in most cases. So the disciplinary measures at the district, at the district level or disp disciplinary measures at the facility level, for example, official warning. But also the, the positive side of that is to have preferential training or promotion for providers uh, in facility with no infraction for past two years. So this is the positive kind of level uh, against the disciplinary measures. And the last attribute is in terms of incentive payment as monetary attribute uh, in a such a way that we had different levels. So whether to, to, have, to have no incentive at all or to have 5% or 10% uh, incremental salary top up uh, for those who does not engage in informal payment for the past six months. So these are the attributes and levels which we try to, 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 to do the experiment to see how these health workers actually uh, reciting their preferences. So this is an example of one of the 12 unlabeled choice sets. So as I said, we have two hypothetical jobs, so job A and job B. So we ask which job would you take between A and B? So they can choose between the two or they can go for neither. So we have that option of opting out. But we've had a follow-up question to ask for those who said neither, we would still like to know which job would you prefer between A and B. And for that case, we analyzed both between forced and unforced kind of analysis. So in terms of the analysis, the main question here is to understand uh, what are the preferred job attributes against informal payment and uh, how these preferences are actually varying across subgroups of health workers. So the main uh, uh, analysis here focused, uh, applied the mixed multinomial rogit model in terms of doing estimating the, 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 the average preferences. But also we went further to do subgroup analysis to estimate the preference heterogeneity, how these preferences vary across subgroups of uh, health workers. And also we estimated the relative importance of attributes and uh, the willingness to pay because we do have the, uh, the monetary attribute. So in terms of the, the result, the, the, the main effect, as I said, we, we surveyed 432 uh, respondents or health workers, which resulted into around 5,000 varied responses in terms of the, 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 the choices. And uh, uh, interesting enough, only 2% of these responses were for the opt-out or status cost scenario for those who went for the NASA option, neither of the two jobs. Uh, so the most uh, around 90, 98, percent actually were choosing between a job a and job b so for that case they preferred to have some sort of improvement as compared to the status quo kind of scenario 
So in terms of this, the significance of this attribute in terms of preference or attributes, except the supervision attribute was significant to influencing uh, health providers' choice for job type. Uh, and in terms of the significance and the coefficients, you can see that on average, health providers preferred cashless mode of payment as opposed to cash transaction. And also they pre preferred significant as opportunity for private practice as compared to lack of that. And they also, in terms of increasing awareness, they preferred the availability of facility notes board to, to have provision of receipts whenever they do any transaction to increase the transparency. Uh, but also uh, they preferred the, the, the existence of hotline number for reporting infraction for those who are engaging in informal payment. And also in terms of measures against informal payment, they, 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 they did not prefer the, the disciplinary measures to control this informal payment as opposed to a promotion or training opportunities for those who don't engage in informal payment. And uh, in terms of monetary attribute, the, 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 the incentive payment, we see that uh, uh, they preferred incremental salary or top ups uh, for those who don't engage in informal payment as opposed to lack of that. So as I said, the, most of these attributes were significantly preferred by these health workers, except the supervision and the disciplinary measures at the district level as compared to disciplinary measures at, at the facility level. So in terms of the relative importance, now we try to rank the different job attributes we do have. So here we use the partial or likelihood method to try and see uh, what are the quite important attributes in terms of influencing uh, uh, job preferences. And here we, as you can see, I've highlighted the top three attributes, which is incentive payment, opportunity for private practice, and the mode of payment, particularly the cashless uh, transaction or cashless mode of payment. So these are the top three uh, attributes which uh, contributed significantly in influencing uh, job preferences. Uh, and the, the, the cumulative share of these influences is around 85% in terms of influencing job uh, preference. Moving on to subgroup analysis to try and see now if we disaggregate these preferences. For example, the issue of supervision throughout at the, at the facility. On average, we didn't see any, any significant preference of this attribute. But if we disaggregate in terms of subgroup, we see that in charges and those with no supplementary job, and also in big uh, facilities, for example, hospitals, uh, this kind of attribute or this strategy we are quite preferred to have supervision throughout 24 hours a day. So you, you, can, you can imagine, for example, the busy facilities like hospitals, uh, it's quite important to have uh, a supervision, a thorough supervision to ensure that people don't have that opportunity to engage in informal payment. The issue of promotion and training opportunity for those who don't engage in informal, informal payments were preferred more by older staff, non-specialist in charges and also in health centers. Uh, staff to no supplementary job, low salary, rural and native provider, those who are working in a district where they were born. Uh, in terms of the monetary incentive, the 20% salary top-up were highly preferred as compared to 5% salary top-up or lack of that. So you can see that the higher the, 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 higher the incentive being uh, proposed in terms of salary top-up, they have the likelihood of increasing the preference for those kind of, that kind of strategy. Uh, but this was more uh, among specialist provider and those uh, uh, engaged in informal payment because we do have this question asking them whether they have ever engaged in informal payment. So for those who say they have ever engaged in informal payment, uh, preferred to have that 10% uh, salary top up than 5% or lack of that. And also uh, the specialists, because we know that uh, the stronger the incentive would be, would trigger the, 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 the behavior change because we know specialists, they are highly paid. So they, they, would, they, would, they would prefer to have a higher salary top up in order for them to, to, to influence change on, on, on this kind of group of provider. Two minutes, but, Peter. Okay, but also the issue of hotline uh, for reporting uh, informal payment was less preferred by those engaged in informal payment because we know that could, uh, they could be identified. So they, they are less likely to prefer that one. And also uh, educated providers. Private practice were preferred uh, more by native uh, provider. So in summary, uh, this is the first study actually to use the, this kind of experiment to examine uh, provider preferences for job attribute against informal payments. And uh, we found 
uh, we found that providers value job attitude that enabled them first to improve their earnings, uh, the issue of private practice and also salary top up, but also the preferred job attributes which uh, could help them to improve their career paths. Uh, for example, the issue of rewarding them in terms of promotion or training opportunity as opposed to punishment. And also the preferred attribute of the job attribute that can improve their working environment and they disincentivize uh, opportunities for informal payments. The issue of cashless payment, receipt provision, availability of North Fold, and the hotline number for reporting. So most preferred job attributes uh, with greatest relative impact, as I said, in terms of the relative of ranking, the salary and private, uh, private practice and cashless uh, payment were the top uh, job attribute in terms of influencing the, the, the job preferences. So uh, to conclude, based on the, the, the finding we have from the experiment, we need to, to, to improve both financial and non-financial job attributes because we found that uh, monetary and non-monetary attributes were actually preferred and also enhanced supervision, especially in the visa facilities, for example, hospitals should be strengthened in order to, to get rid of this informal payment. And also uh, enhanced the career path matters, uh, most among orders and then this kind of subgroups of provider. Financial incentives are actually expensive, but matters at least from 10% salary uh, top up uh, and have strong incentive, especially for higher earners and uh, specialists. Uh, in general, our finding reinforces the need of targeted intervention to target in a particular subgroup of provider, which account for preference at regional accounts uh, across providers as potential way to reduce chances of engaging uh, in informal payment in Tanzania. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was fascinating um, description of your discrete choice experiment. I'm just going to have a quick look. I haven't seen any particular questions. There's a very interesting question that has been posed by someone about how we were able to engage and do this research, but I will pick up on that um, once all of the presentations have been done. So now with a slight conflict of interest, I'm going to um, provide the third presentation, which is really a roundup. So with the SOAS ACE Consortium, the work that we've been doing on health has been in uh, Nigeria, Tanzania, but also in Bangladesh. So I will speak briefly, uh, giving you an overview of, of the main approach and also the sort of collective findings of the ways in which the projects have spoken to one another and what's been um, important there. So in the interest of transparency, I will put a timer on so you will hear my alarm go off. Um, let me great so my uh, my um presentation again is in uh, relation to the front line so health workers how we can tackle anti-corruption um at the front line and the sorts of changes that we need in terms of research within health systems so although I said at the beginning of this um, meeting that there hasn't been a huge amount of interest amongst health systems researchers, there has been interest in anti-corruption um, in public health for quite a while. It hasn't taken off perhaps in the way that we had hoped it had before, but there are more traditional approaches and then there are these newer approaches. So what I want to do is try and sort of tease out some of those differences and then demonstrate what that means to the sort of research that we've been doing. So there'll be some echoes and some connections between the presentations that were given by Charles and Peter before we eventually then move on to Sebastian's presentation, which is at a different scale, but also extremely important. Okay, so first of all, what have the more... Ah, my, there we go. What have the more traditional approaches been to corruption? within public health? Well, for the most part, traditional approaches to corruption within public health focus on two tools, accountability and trans... Sorry, my computer is having a glitch. Has, has focused on accountability and transparency measures in anti-corruption tools. So that's the first point. Real focus on accountability and transparency transparency as the anti-corruption tools that will be used. So a lot of research has focused on ways in which um, they can find sort of answers to ways in which accountability and transparency should be used or have had those assumptions at, certainly at the back of their mind. Very often in early approaches to corruption in public health, 
there has been an attempt to create change across the health system or even across the whole of the health sector. So the more targeted approaches that um, Peter and Charles were talking about are new. Prior to that, it was considered that you would have to, very often it's sort of talked about in terms of culture, you need a, a, a culture change or a change in the norms across the system so people everywhere will be more rule abiding. And those sorts of, so th those sorts of approaches dominated this early um, discussion of anti-corruption. Rarely in these approaches, although they do mention power, rarely are these factored into strategies. Rarely are people thinking about how to implement this, um, thinking about are, are people who are going to be involved, are they going to be willing to call people to account or are they going to be able to call others to account? And I think here we can sort of tease out issues, you know, is it, is it reasonable to think that community members could call uh, managers in in health clinics to account around corruption for example if you're looking for those very bottom-up approaches do they really have enough power enough you know ability to do so so really questioning who has got the power to implement an anti-corruption strategy that wasn't there in these earlier approaches okay but they were interested in a range of reasons so th there was not also the sort of interest in the range of reasons that there might be for cor for what we would classify as corrupt practices that some form of corruption also solves problems at the same time that they're corrupt, they solve problems. So I think we're sort of, we may be seeing this in some of Peter's research that informal payments may subsidize poor salaries. Um, and this is some work that, that um, Heather Marquette, although not necessarily focusing always on health has been doing to think about, okay, if corruption solves problems, sometimes it's still corruption. If we want to get rid of this corrupt practice, we first of all need to tackle the problems that it's solving in particular health systems. Okay, so why then, if we have these older approaches, why do we need newer ones? Why can't we just carry on with business as usual? Well, the main fact, the main sort of argument is, which is very compelling, is that transparency and accountability approaches haven't yielded the results we'd hoped for. We haven't had the sort of massive shift away from corruption within health systems. Um, in the work that has been done. And we think that one of the reasons this is, and we argue it in a paper that we wrote collectively about targeted anti-corruption strategies, this is because very often transparency and accountability approaches ignore the context in which people live and provide care. So they ignore the difficulties, they ignore the problems that maybe they're seeking to overcome with some forms of corruption that then create conflicts of interest, that then create um, you know, different insidious forms of corruption that emerge within the health system. And also these transparency and accountability approaches created a universal benchmarking process that didn't consider historical context. And in particular arguments that they didn't, didn't consider the colonial historical context in which um, a lot of countries around the world, you know, they, they built their health system within this particular post-colonial context and then that was very important so what was happening was we had a universal benchmarking process with Euro America at the top using particular types of strategies and then different countries would be considered or would be sort of mapped against the gains that had been made in other places which was just completely inappropriate. We also have realized that in other sectors, there's been a search for new approaches to anti-corruption in which context and social relations and politics have been taken into account. So for, in some ways, very useful for um, health systems research that we have other people who are making inroads into anti-corruption who have experienced the same problems with transparency and accountability approaches that have been very heavily invested in in other sectors that haven't yielded the sort of results that were needed. and so. So we can draw on work that has been done in other sectors in order to find new approaches to anti-corruption within health systems. So that's really one of the things that collectively um, with teams across Bangladesh and, Ni and Nigeria and Tanzania, we've been working, working towards together. And that's all within our publication in BMJ Global Health. But we need to translate these approaches into health systems. We can't just take them wholesale. Um, you know, from the water or the power sector and then put them straight into health systems. We need approaches that recognise the complexity of the system, the variety of actors in the system, how politics and social networks pervade health systems, the range of forms of corruption that take place. 
some of which are problem solving forms of, of corruption. And we also need to think about the feedback loops and the influence. So it's a, a, a difficult task. But what we have done is try to translate um, the approach that Charles described, where there are four strategies to try and target, have high impact approaches to anti-corruption. So once you've done the work that has been done in Tanzania and the work that has been done in Nigeria, but also in Bangladesh, where you, you look at forms of corruption that are the most insidious, that are the most detrimental to the health system, then you think about those forms of corruption and think about, well, can we change group incentives? Can we think about the different groups of actors that are often seen as homogenous and think about what the different incentives are amongst them? Can we create new forms of collective action that will create groups who are powerful enough to affect anti-corruption? Is it possible to bring people together whose interest, who have interests in common? And in particular for health systems, we added one more um, approach to this, which is targeted anti-corruption investments. So I think Peter showed very clearly in his, in his work how um, for those uh, health workers who had been involved in uh, taking informal payments, that an increase in salary was something that was considered to, that was something that, that would work or could work if you introduce a policy that aims to clamp down on informal payments at the same time that salary goes up, that that could be a very effective anti-corruption strategy. So across the countries, and I'm conscious that my time is running out rather fast, across the countries, so the research was, that was done under um, Dr. Masood in Barak in Bangladesh, research in Nigeria and also in Tanzania, when we were thinking about, um, in particular, the, the differences between actors, and I think this is in some ways the nub of what needs to be taken up in health systems research, is you need to think about people that you might usually, from a health systems perspective, consider to be a homogenous group junior doctors, nurses working in urban areas, nurses working in rural areas, clinical officers, and think about actually the ways in which these apparently homogenous groups are made up of people who are very differently connected across different um, socioeconomic and political networks, because those will stratify who has access um, to particular ways of making improvements, um, on, on the individual's experience within the system, but they may well allow these different individuals to be rule breaking and to be corrupt in a way that others can't be. And when we think about the strategies that we're going to use in health systems, we also need to know that although we would like to manage corruption across all different, um, differently positioned health workers, there are some that through policy, there are some that would need wide, widespread political change rather than simply policy tools. And what we look at when we think about the social networks in which these different health workers are caught is that we're looking for those who perhaps don't have such strong networks but could be brought together as a collective group to act, to, to act against others who are more powerful. So let me try and show you how this has worked. So in Bangladesh, we found socioeconomic and political networks who provided access to certain junior doctors to better postings and we found local networks that can also improve experiences of rural postings. So they were very important in stratifying which junior doctors were able to stay um, in rural postings and which ones left immediately. In Nigeria, um, as Charles mentioned, political networks provide godfathers and godmothers to certain health workers, and these protect corrupt actors. So that socio medical networks between doctors and administrators could protect absent health workers from sanction so that you can be corrupt and no one will act on that. And in Tanzania, although we're still teasing out a lot of this qualitative research, we find that socio-medical networks between different cadres of health workers distribute services and payments. So networks of doctors refer patients on to one another and distribute the informal payments as they do so. So once we found out about these social networks and ways in which they distribute access to different things and the ways in which they protect particular individuals from corruption, in particular absenteeism and informal payments, we started to think about how we could map these and how we could make sense of the health system and the ways in which corruption works at the front line. And where I'm really going to sort of start to wrap up then is to think about health systems approaches to anti-corruption and what it is that they need to recognize. 
So when we're thinking about approaches to anti-corruption, we need to think about the formal policy content. It matters. What are the anti-corruption policies that are in play in a particular health system? What governs the behavior of different actors all the way through the health system? While we focus on the front line, it's not exclusive, you know, we, we recognize that there's, you know, there are all sorts of different spaces in the health system where you need to tackle anti-corruption. So you need to ask yourself, you know, what are the key policies governing the different cadres, the payment, the promotion, the allocation of resources? You know, what are the problems that there are within these policies, which policies are adhered to and, and, and sort of stuck, um, stuck to by which actors? Then, of course, you need to take you need to take note of the health system. We know that these forms, as I've said several times already, that these forms of corruption may emerge in underfunded systems. Is your system well funded or underfunded? What's the condition of the infrastructure? What's the workload like for the different health workers who are there? What's the patient to health worker ratio? OK, that's my time. I've gone off, so I've got two minutes. What are the prospects for promotion? What's the potential to realize professional goals? So really tease out what's happening in great detail in the health system. And then I think one of the things that we have, have sought to add through the ACE approach is to think about the social networks and the informal rules that are generated by the social networks. So we have the formal rules and the formal policy content and matched to that right below in this screen are the informal rules that get generated in these social networks. So we have structured networks of political patronage, socioeconomic networks, socio-medical networks in Tanzania that distribute opportunities for training and additional income and recruitment. And we need to think about health workers as positioned differently according to these social networks and the informal rules generated by them. Are they health workers that sit within, sit within very powerful networks or are they health workers that sit in less powerful networks? And how can we create forms of collective action amongst these different groups of health workers to tackle the corruption that is in the system. And then finally, I just want to um, have, a, have a slide which is about all, you know, which, which represents all of the partners that we've had in this project. It's, it's represented a, a huge amount of work from, um, from Tanzania, from Nigeria and from Bangladesh. And, and an awful lot of research has gone on to try to draw this together and to, to try and try and create these new approaches. Um, these targeted anti-corruption interventions. So thank you very much to all of the partners and I will stop there. Okay, I'm just going to quickly check and see if there are any particular questions. Okay, so we have a question, some questions coming up, but I'm going to move straight on um, to our final speaker who is not part of the ACE, so as ACE Consortium, but I think whose presentation very nicely speaks to the importance of finding points of risk within the system. And again, I think what it does is it can underpin, you know, a, a, a different, um, more targeted approach perhaps. But we'll hear from um, Dr. Sebastian Hayen, um, who's an associate professor at the University of Antigua um, in Colombia. He holds a PhD in systems engineering um, and for more than 10 years his focus of research has been about healthcare logistics and health systems. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about corruption risk and indicators for public hospitals and territorial health agencies in Colombia. Sebastian, let me hand over to you. Okay, good day uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian Haem and I am assistant professor at the University of Antioquia, Colombia. And I'm going to introduce a brief description of our work, Corruption Risk Indicators for Public Hospitals and Territorial Health Agencies in Colombia. For those who are not familiar with my country, well, let me give a, a little introduction. You know, Colombia, we are um, located in Latin America. Our population is um, nearly 50 million. Uh, we are a middle income country, we are very unequal, even though our government runs on a democratic institutions. We are still a young country um, and the fertility rates have been decreasing, rates have been decreasing uh, over the past years. The life expectancy in Colombia has been increasing. We have a, a lot of unemployment. We have a, excuse me here, so also have a glitch. 
So we have a very informal labor sector and our country has a high perception of corruption. And sadly, I mean, some of this corruption comes from the healthcare sector. As you know, the healthcare sector is especially prone from corruption given its complexity and the asymmetry of information. How is the structure of our healthcare system? So we have a, a system who's called a regulated competition. Uh, we have for-profit, public and private insurance companies and healthcare providers that sometimes brings a problem, sometimes that brings a, an opportunity. So we have a mixed system. I will show you later how it is mixed. The spending on health, uh, the, the overall spend of the country uh, of health is 7.3% of GDP. And the out-of-pocket spending is 60% of the total Colombia healthcare spend, spending. That is not uh, a lot, but it's, it's also not great. So, so the system uh, is like this. We have in, in the same system, we have uh, three special regimes. The, three regimes. The, the first one is the special regime, which is for the teachers, uh, the military forces, and some university professors. We have the contributory regime, which is for all the workers who work for companies. And the subsidiary regime, who is the, the people who cannot pay, so the, 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 the government paid for them. So the special regime and the contributory regime, it works like a sort of a Bismarck system where some percentage of your paycheck and some percent of the employer provides the, the, the care and is mostly run by the uh, private sector. But the subsidiary regime, it works like a, the beverage system and it runs uh, on taxes and is mostly handled by the public sector. As you can see, pretty much half of the people that, need, that uses the, the healthcare system is covered by the subsidized regime and and that is is a problem because sometimes the 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 Bismarck system has more quality and people have more opportunities while the beverage system is not I mean has a lot of problems and 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 because it's it's mostly run by the public sector so it experience a lot of problems of corruption one of the biggest success of Colombia is the coverage is one of the is the highest coverage uh, and even though supposedly everybody has access to healthcare, we still have a lot way to go because we have problems of, of quality. So what kind of corrupt practices we, do we have in Colombia? So it must, in, in, especially in public hospitals, the, um, one of the biggest problems and by far is, is the, the largest is facilitated the corrupt allocation of contracts to parties and allies. Also service not mating contracts specifications and also thief of new assets before delivery to end user or before being recorded. And also this, this was very popular uh, like a few years ago, artificially increases in the prevalence of high cost illnesses, just like a hemophilia, AIDS, etc. And insurance companies, uh, for instance, the, the most common problems are uh, insuring affluent people to the subsidiary regime, so, so they don't have to pay our rich, I mean, not rich people, but people who could pay, but they don't pay. Diversion of resources out of the healthcare system to, to support another kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurs and denying access to costly treatment. This is one of the most uh, common practice that we can find. So how do we prevent corruption? So the first thing that we have to do is to try to to understand how the, the system works. So first we have the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Health have a federal agents, agency which uh, its main role is the surveillance. I mean, to be aware what is going on and to try to sanction when it needs to. So this, this federal agency uh, also has like a state level healthcare secretaries and, and also municipal level healthcare secretaries and at the bottom are the public hospitals. As you can see, different, different agencies that have different uh, roles and things to do. And supposedly the federal agency has to oversight these three types of institutions plus insurance companies and private hospitals. 
So our focus, the focus of our research goes to, to try to spot and try to track corruption in these three institutions. And this type of, these three type of institutions because um, they have some properties and they run on the public sector. So we ha they have some properties that for us was easier to, to see because the insurance companies and the private hospital, they run on the private, so it's more difficult. So how is the methodology? So the methodology is, yes, we have these three types of institutions. So we have to, we have several meetings with the federal agency. We have workshops and also we review in the literature. We took some work by Suleta. Uh, they were developing some kind of similar uh, approach in, in the Mexico conste, uh, context and also in, in Colombia. So basically you come up with this. The first thing that you have to do is to identify the first, the, 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 the case stone processes. Second, identify the risk and three, design the indicators. Yes. So we have to understand that we have public funds and these public funds comes to these institutions and they become processes. Yeah. So so all what they do is by doing these things, contracting, billing, collecting, insuring, inspecting, and providing care. So these processes, they have a, a special risk. For instance, in contracting, concentration is a big problem. A cost and billing, the lack of billing for provided services and collecting delayed or lack of collection and insuring too many or too few people insure and inspecting too many or too few san sanctions and providing care, low quality care. And then you have to try to figure out how to make your indica indicators. But how you make your indicators, it depends on the sources of information that you have, yes? And that is why we approach only these three types of institutions because we have access to the public information and Colombia has been advancing a lot in trying to, to make public and accessible this kind of information. So because of that, we could work. And then you design the indicators. So these are not the real indicators that we use in the study, but I just wanna give you a glimpse how you can design your indicators. Basically the philosophy, the philosophy of this indicator, the main approach that you need to do is try to, to find proportions of things. For instance, for the, uh, look at the first indicator. We have the contract I over the, uh, over the total contracts. So in, the, in that case, what you can see is if my specific contract is, is, is a higher proportion of the total con contract, something could be happening. And also the billing at a certain time, if you bill, more than the average, or if, if your bills are uh, more than 360 days over the total bills, so something could be happening. So the, the main philosophy of this is try to find indicators who can spot anomalies or different things in your system. So this is something that is, is very important because it, in that case, you, 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 have, you are trying to find what kind of things they buy from the average or, or the main behavior, okay? This is the, the, the basic approach of this. And then when you have these indicators, you have to create some index. So the index, what it does is to compound all the indicators or mix it together and, and come up with a result, with a number. In this case, this number comes from zero to one, where zero is, is, is become no risky and one is very risky. Yes, in all the institutions. So we make like a, some kind of dashboard so, so we can see and, and we can see, for instance, how this indicator for each institution has been changing in three years. So we can see, for instance, which one uh, state, for instance, if the state, uh, what, which one state is more, is more risky in terms of corruption according to those processes, or even we can go to the, the municipal level so in this case, you can see, for instance, uh, every, every, every mark on the map of Colombia is, is showing a municipality. And if it's darker, it's because they have more risk. So you can see that in some parts of Colombia, they are more, uh, they are more prone or more risky than the other areas. Okay, so when we see the final results, so we, we, we took, for instance, 882 territorial municipal agencies and what we found was that 25% are in the high risk of corruption. 
and 57% is are in the medium risk of corruption. Uh, this is this is not uh, something very nice. is 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 a very unfortunate result. But when we look at the public hospitals, they have a completely different distribution, where uh, lucky for us, just one percent are in the high risk, and and nine percent in the medium risk. So so bas this is the basic approach that we have. So in this case, what we are trying to do is try to find indicators who let us like um, like uh, try to to see where these kind of uh, situations are more prone of corruption. So when you have a high risk of corruption, you immediately you have to do an intervention. And when you have median, what, what you have to do is a more rigorous monitoring and try to see what is going on. Okay, so basically this is all what I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sebastian, and perfect in terms of your timing. You were absolutely spot on. Um, I realise that we only have four minutes for questions. So what I want to do is just read out a couple of questions um, that uh, have come up. I think um, we can always be found at our email addresses if people have questions that they want to ask afterwards or on, you know, on, on Twitter if people want to ask questions um, about individual presentations. So um, there's a very long question, which is for me, but I think um, let's start quickly. Uh, so I would like, um, Charles, would you please just address the first question that came in was about how public health systems and organizations often resist research and evaluation into accountability. We have found this over our research, um, but Charles, would you just speak to, you know, how you were able to engage people just as quickly as you can and convince them to get approval for your work or to draw people into the research that you were doing? So we would often, thank you for the question, it's very interesting really, sometimes when you find resistance from people, even yesterday we continue to see these things, people who try to resist you because you're talking about corruption, you're talking about things they don't want to talk about. I think key is to build on um, existing relationships. So we've been working with most of these guys for long, and um, so, so, so we build on that. We try to tell them our, our research, our approach will, will bring solutions that we're trying to solve problems here. And, and then when we build on this, you know, and, and kind of engage with um, top level managers, they, they tend to give us um, easy access. Convince the managers that by accepting or binding to your programs, they will have better policies. And, and you know, their works will make it easier. I think that is the key for us here, working yeah. on existing relationships and trying to convince um, the stakeholders, the managers, that this work is going to bring policies, policy suggestions that will improve their work. Great. Thank you very much. I think the lesson is it can be done. And I think this is one of the most important things perhaps that we should should bring, and I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that our session, unfortunately, is about to come to an end, but um, is that it's possible to do this corruption research and it is possible to talk to people, even in places, I don't know, Peter, whether you wanted to come in and just say something about how it was in Tanzania, perhaps, but overall, you, you have to strategize um, and it can be difficult in certain places, but it is possible and it is possible very often with the qualitative research through known networks, through trusted networks of people, you can get the most nuanced understanding of informal payments, of absenteeism, of corruption within the health system. Um, Peter, do you have, we've got one minute, do you have anything? Now for the interest of time now. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up there. We've got one minute left and I think we're about to wait for a screen to come up. Um, so thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending. It is a conversation I hope that has just begun. So please do get in touch with us. Please do think about doing research on corruption. It's possible. It's important to deal with feasible, targeted approaches. And um, in the last 30 seconds, please, can I ask everyone to look on the, um, the main website at Reimagining Health Systems, Future Scenarios for Better Health and Social Justice, um, if you click on the link that is, is given there and is on the main website, um, it's important to identify the changes that will impact on health systems now and in the future. And I certainly think that one of them will be 
um, a substantial anti-corruption approach that is targeted and tackles the most pernicious forms of corruption in any health system. Have a very good day, have a very good evening, have a very good morning. Thank you very much for joining.